Digital Foundry is sponsored by MSI's new range of next generation QD OLED gaming monitors with 27 and 32 inch 16 by 9 displays alongside 49 and 34 inch ultra wides. These high refresh rate screens feature a graphene film with a custom heatsink gaming intelligence AI features and MSI Care 2.0 OLED burning protection. Check out the video description to learn more about MSI's excellent range of OLED gaming panels. Uh, well, hello there and welcome in a way to uh, Digital Foundry Direct Weekly number 167. Uh, as usual, our weekly uh, show discussing the latest gaming and technology news. I've been out of the picture for a few directs now. Uh, I was at the US, uh, at IGN <laughs> Live. So if you go to IGN, uh, check out the Future of Gaming panel I did with NVIDIA. That was pretty neat. Um, but I'm back and uh, joining me for this particular Direct, the, the Come Down Direct, you might call it. Uh, first of all, Alex Battaglia. Now, Rich, if you read the comments to last week's Direct, apparently you were in the United States because you were looking at the Microsoft Xbox handheld. Is this true? No. <laughs> well, that was oh, really? that was the scuttlebutt in the comments, Rich. They oh, thought you were all over at, there. I was looking at Switch Three. <laughs> That's what it was. <laughs> the problem, though, Rich, is even if you were doing that, you couldn't say that you were doing that. Obviously, so maybe you were doing that, and you're just playing dumb here. Yeah. The closest I got was seeing uh, Phil Spencer in the uh, IGN Live green room. And oh, it was that was like, it. Hi. Yeah. <laughs> literally two minutes of conversation that was the closest we got to any kind of uh, microsoft related uh, hashtag content that's funny but no that's it uh john linneman hi oh yes i'm here as well you're of course. Here. Uh, yes yes the uh the fire is put out and we're back to clouds although Ooh. it's a little overexposed back there i TV's can get too it right for the camera <laughs> Um, I did enjoy your uh, introduction to uh, last week's direct. Oh, well done. yes. Yeah. Well, okay. I was trying to channel the proper direct style and yeah, you know, it, it took awesome. a little good, good, good. <laughs> so, yeah, this show is obviously uh, the show after the major shows. Uh, we've got a couple of bits and pieces from the summer events to tie up, but it's going to be maybe a shorter direct than usual. Who knows? Um, but let's get straight to it. Okay. So um, first news topic of the week. We're going to be talking about Star Wars Outlaws, or more specifically, to begin with, Ubisoft Forward, uh, which was like an hour-long, two-hour-long event that uh, happened earlier in the week. Uh, the final summer showcase. And uh, skipping through it, there only appeared to be sort of two major pieces of content, Star Wars Outlaws and Assassin's Creed Shadows. whole bunch of uh, stuff on live service games and DLC, which I'm sure you were hugely enthused by, John. <laughs> I mean, I'll, I'll tell you this, Rich. You know I'm not a fan of those things, but those are already existing properties. Right. And the fact that they're just continuing them rather than, you know, using resources to make more of them, I'm okay with that. You know, okay. Yeah, okay. Support, support those existing communities. I, I want those people to be happy and enjoy it. And, you know, they showed Rainbow Six Siege, and I actually enjoyed Rainbow Six Siege for a year or so. Uh and then I had, didn't keep up with it, and now I just would get destroyed, and it's probably no fun anymore. But <laughs> at, at first, it was actually a game I enjoyed a lot. So. Mm. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Um, so there you let, go. <laughs> let's talk about Star Wars Outlaws, uh, which was kind of like the major showcase event. There were two, obviously, AC, but Star Wars came first. And I don't think we can continue this discussion without talking about the... Uh, uh, ridiculous state of streaming on Nine. YouTube. I mean, bearing in mind that Star Wars Outlaws and uh, Assassin's Creed have had so much investment in their massive amounts of um, development resource thrown at these amazing games. And yet, the biggest summer showcase of the year, and it looks like trash. What's going on? This is just a real problem that needs to be addressed, right? Yeah, I'm completely confused by this as well. So obviously, the thing about streaming right now is these services do actually support up to 4K60 um, in, a, in a stream capacity. Jeff actually did this for the Summer Games Fest, but weirdly enough, the actual input resolution was just 1080p, and they were doing nearest upscaling, upsca likely cool. using OBS uh, to the 4K feed. But even, even with that, though, you still got a, an improved bit rate, so the presentation wasn't bad. Xbox looked fantastic, I thought. Like, the stream quality was, oh, was, great. was about as good as you can get right now, realistically. So that that is a good example of what you should do. Was that one you, live? I 
Uh, yes, it did. I, I, I went I on YouTube, it went to live, and I had to skip through the live section to get to... Yeah, it was yeah, okay. So, so I think it was live, not not like a, you know, one of those pre-scheduled things. But then Ubisoft comes along, and I can't, I can't remember if it was just 10... I think it must have been 1080p60. Yeah. But both on Twitch and on YouTube, the quality of the bitrate was so low, in addition to actual playback problems with the content that made every game look choppy. There was visible tearing in some of the assets. The All the detail was absolutely just ruined by the macro blocking. It, I would say that it just, it actually made the games look outdated and bad because at this point, you know, the games have become so detailed that when you take away all that fine detail, you just lose, you lose sight of what you're actually looking at. And I think that's the case here. And I think they really, however they set it up, they need to fix it because they did a disservice to all the games that they showed at this showcase Ubisoft did. And mm -hmm. I think it is quite fixable, but they really can't afford to be doing this because anybody watching this is going to have a bad experience. It might look moderately okay on a phone screen, maybe, but if you're watching in any slightly larger window, it's just a mess of pixels and blur. And it was uh, atrocious. It, And then I went back, obviously, for this and checked out these gameplay sequences from S Star Wars Outlaws and Assassin's Creed. And it's like, oh, these games actually look really good. It's yep. just you, you genuinely could not tell from at first I thought ma maybe Star Wars had a massive downgrade going on. That's what a lot of people wrote online. <laughs> right. They were like, but oh, reality, they downgraded it. It's like, nah, not really. Exactly. It's like, maybe not. <laughs> like, maybe there is some details. We'll have to check. But by and large, it doesn't really feel that way when you see the higher quality assets. But when you watch the stream, you would think it runs terribly and looks a lot worse. So caution flag for anybody doing these streams. I know it's difficult for sure. You need a lot of bandwidth, but, you know, they had a whole stage. They can afford this. There, there are ways to do it, uh, and they needed to do it because they're harming their own games. Yeah, basically. there's something else as well. I mean, I've been away, so I came back this morning to check out the uh, Ubisoft Forward and uh, I searched for Ubisoft Forward on YouTube. First result, you'd think it's the Ubisoft version, right? But no, it was GameSpot, the GameSpot Coast theme, right. which didn't have any additional added value content. For example, commentators talking about what they're seeing. It was just literally a mirror of what Ubisoft had done. So that originally bad quality that was on Ubisoft became an order of magnitude worse because it was going through a second generation real-time encoding. And I just couldn't believe what I was seeing and to the point where I had to sort of quit out because it looked so hideous. And uh, then I went to the Ubisoft stream, which still had issues. And then I went to the gameplay trailers, which were, you know, effectively uploads of the streams that were within the mainstream. And um, suddenly it looked a whole lot better. Oh my God, so, Rich. You're right. Yeah. I'm looking at this GameSpot one now. <laughs> yeah. And I'll tell you what I hate about this stuff, because it destroys archives for the future, right? We oh, yeah. We have to go back to old media that was released years ago. And obviously in the past, media quality was a lot worse. But like these types of low-quality uploads really damage future discoverability for these old assets. It makes it look... It's it's unusable in the future. Yeah, like, in, this should not exist. In what world, in a search engine, does you know, a copy of the original actually come out on top of the original. <laughs> the new search happening. engines of the world, AI powered yeah. ones, AI, love AI, that. AI, yeah. Yeah, this, oh my God, this GameSpot stream. Oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 like, this, this is a, it's an affront to mankind that should be deleted. <laughs> Man. Oh, man. Yes. So you can see what my initial uh, reaction to Ubisoft Forward was not particularly positive, which it's is a shame at all. because, um, well, actually, we'll go into the Star Wars Outlaws um, trailer, which was uh, long, detailed, and uh, kudos, actually, to Ubisoft for actually having faith in a game and gameplay to the extent that they can show it at length. Mm -hmm. You know, a nice Very. developer walkthrough saying what's going on. That's great. One thing which uh, is slightly curious, though, going back to the technical side of things, is that um, it was 1440p60 upload, which right. is Strange. odd. Says to me, possibly they used NVIDIA share <laughs> slash shadow play to record <laughs> it, which may explain the judder. Yes. There's, there's think two things there. There's judder, there's frame drops. Yeah, there's yes. better and frame drops, right? John, it's com it's 
100% consistent with my experience when using NVIDIA Share. Unfortunately, you can get decent footage as long as you perfectly match the input and output refresh rates, but even then you're still going to get some skips. But if, for instance, you're playing on like a higher refresh monitor and you're at 60 FPS locked or so, or sorry, if you're playing at a higher frame rate and then you're trying to record with Share and your Share is set to 60 hertz capture... Yep. Uh, you end up with just horrendous frame pacing, mm -hmm. skipped frames, you know, duplicate frames everywhere, all kinds of artifacts. And based on this and the fact that it's also ultra wide, which I assume is just, you know, something wow. they're doing for PC. This or is, is, the, it, or is the whole game. The, this is the uh, second time they've showed the game and it was ultra wide the first time too. So I'm actually starting to oh, think this is an ultra wide interesting. game. Um, fascinating we talked about this last time right uh when we when we this is last year around august That's i believe right yeah, yeah, uh, yeah and we talked about it when they showed off avatar avatar was 16.9 and this was 21.9 so i like the shadow play theory but another theory that i have is actually that this is supposed to look like console footage where however because oh, alex no 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 listen seriously <laughs> okay. no okay, i'm not go, being go, i'm not go. being uh how do you say it glib or something <laughs> like that uh <laughs> I'm uh, so Avatar, uh, the last game uh, running on Snowdrop in its 60 FPS mode, which is what this trailer is, targets 1440p. Actually, it is yes. 1440p output even. Uh, and they also there's a number of points in the trailer where they show off things like shadows and stuff or uh, character reflections and things like that. And in the console settings, those things are kind of like noticeably lower quality. Sure. Uh, the highest quality presets don't have the errors that we see in this trailer in Snowdrop. So they're showing the game at some sort of medium-like quality. It, it, you know, characters are only handled by SSR. And if you look at K's shadow, like a really good example is at, sorry, I have a whole bunch of notes here. I'm looking at it. At, at around 704 and thereafter. If you look at K's yep. shadow, one of the things I pointed out when I was looking at Avatar is that if you use the console quality settings for shadows, your character shadow is actually really low res for the entire game. And that's something that isn't there at the highest quality that the game offers. Not even I'm not even talking about uh, ultra, uh, sorry, like unobtainium quality. I'm talking about just like ultra. Uh, and there's a number of other things in the trailer, including the resolution if you look at her hair, that actually really make me think that they're trying to present the game in a way as if it was recorded on a console. I can't say it was. It uses like Xbox Series X controller prompts or something like that. It does. But um, I think this so is actually trying to look like the game as work in progress, which is why they have like vignette shots, for example, of where they show where there's no camera control. Those are actually right. a perfect 60 where they show like, I don't know, like parts of Tatooine from like a super cinematic looking camera, that stuff's all 60. But when it shows gameplay, then it is immediately this weird, improperly paced, right. low frame rate thing. And I think what we're seeing is perhaps just work in progress build, actually. Um, okay. So, I mean, I can also send Ubi an email, but uh, you know, I, I actually looking at this, they've, they've released media before that is really high quality. Uh, <laughs> like the, uh, the, nvidia stuff they sent out is actually really yeah. super high quality so i think someone at ubisoft knows how to record something um, well i'm sure they do it's just so i i'm still convinced that it might be a combination of the two where i think you're absolutely right that they're capturing this at console settings right i think that makes sense but just the way the frame presents it doesn't quite look like just normal slowdown to my eyes it has a much jerkier appearance to it somehow yeah. That's what you know I what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, if it was just dipping into the 50s, it, it wouldn't present quite like this. Well, I mean, that's so, why I said, like, work in progress. I think maybe right, it's not would, dipping even, into the you, 50s. I think it's probably dipping into the 30s or 40s just because it's bad build or something like that. Maybe. Well, <laughs> whichever way you slice it, it's still not the way you want to present the game. To, right. Uh, yeah. It's a bad idea. Yeah. Millions. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Like, especially even if, you know, it still is in development, that's not the way to show it. And, uh, yeah, I mean... It's, it's weird. It's weird. For sure, for sure. Um, uh, but other than that, other than the, the, the problems, I'd say, with frame rate uh, of the trailer itself, there's a lot of other great 
uh, image things that are going on that we've seen before in this engine, as well as some new things uh, that weren't in Avatar. One of the interesting things I want to talk about there is that Avatar is like a first person game. Uh, and it's actually kind of lighter on post processing. Uh, it even, you know, to the point where like, you know, a lot of the, I think in the original version of the game launching, like they didn't have like even motion blur in the 60 FPS mode on console. Like they really tried to keep it like this pristine look. And here it's kind of the opposite. There's a lot of motion blur generally. And, uh, there's also, they added in a number of camera effects that were not at all in the original uh, like Avatar, Snowdrop version of the engine. For example, I think it's like at 825 in the trailer, you can see anamorphic lens flares, which Avatar didn't have at all, but it's like a staple of like the Star Wars aesthetic at this point in time. I actually don't know how many lens flares are in the original film. I actually don't think too many. Uh, they tried to keep them out of most shots, I think. But uh, here, it's definitely all over the trailer. Like whenever it's... like some sort of large LED, like LED style light shows up on screen, uh, you can always see a huge lens flare there, which is kind of cool. I don't, I don't think it looks that good at the point where about eight twenty seven, just due to the way it presents as the enemy walks through the door, it's like extremely noisy and mm -hmm. just kind of glitchy. Yeah, it looks I glitchy. Remember right? that in Star Wars, it looks more like a JJ Abrams, right? Style. <laughs> right. Uh, like as soon as she starts to shoot him, it starts flickering and behaving strangely, where it just looks bad. So, uh, so hopefully they fix that. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's a lot of reasons for that, but usually, like, you try and like clamp it so it doesn't do that right, um right another thing is that if you it's all 21 by 9 which is you know i actually do think this may be a 21 by 9 game on console because the last you time we saw right. this when they did this for any game it was with senua and my goodness that is obviously 21 9 um is that there's also like a really large vignette on this right left hand side of the screen and so oh, yeah. everything is looking like like super dark in the corners. And it actually gave me a weird claustrophobic feel when I watched it on a big screen, uh, even though the FOV is pretty high. Uh, so I'm not exactly a big fan of that, actually. I don't like vignette usually in, in games. It's, it's a kind of interesting uh, perspective to have claustrophobia on an old ultra wide presentation. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, it's just like uh, it's like darkening in your peripheral vision. Uh, if you've ever like John with VR, you know what that's like, like any sort of darkening oh, there. Makes you feel tunneled yeah, almost. It's pretty distracting. I would agree. Uh, but I mean, I, I mean, hmm, they they probably are just trying to replicate the look of like a film, mm -hmm. you know, with these filmic aspects. Mm -hmm. uh, whether that's a great idea or not remains to be seen. But mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, so any, any thoughts on the actual content? Uh, yeah. Well, one thing I was surprised about was with the space combat which I don't think we saw to the same degree before, nope. uh, is that uh, it's like an arcadey kind of shooter, but they still have aspects of like simulation games in there. They have lead pips on the reticle, which is something I've only ever seen in sim games. Uh, like, because blasters in Star Wars are not uh, like instantaneous travel. They have like a travel time. Yeah, And here in space, like you're not shooting at the vehicle but you're shooting at a ui element in front of the vehicle and usually a lot of games would just uh either not show that or make it just flub it so that the character is just hitting where they're shooting and here they actually added that in which i think maybe will point to the fact that your ship is like upgradable and you'll have different type of guns on it at some point because that's a it's a not exactly a newbie friendly way to make shooting in a game that you shoot some sort of ui element i thought that was kind of interesting cool yeah John? Yeah, I mean, so obviously what they're really trying to show is that it's more, it's open world, but it's also open universe, if you will. Uh, have they specified how many planets are in this game? Uh, they only mentioned a few, so I don't think they have. I'm sure there's more than... But obviously one of the key things they're trying to do here is a seamless travel from planet surface to space and then back down yeah. to planet surface. You know, mm -hmm. they kind of hide the loading of assets in the atmospheric uh, conditions around the planet which makes perfect sense anyway uh obviously this would be a design decision on their part and a cool thing i mean we've seen there was uh that game haven call of the king on ps2 even that already did this like 20 something years ago which was pretty nuts at the time uh so it can't so people obviously make the starfield connection right but starfield i think is just a different beast in terms of what it's trying to do and how that engine works fundamentally which made that tough but mm -hmm. i think it's cool that these guys have 
obviously prioritize that. Uh, I was a little surprised and bummed to see that once again, we're going down to Tatooine. You know, it's like, <laughs> like I, I'm still confused by this, given that in the films, it's specifically referred to as like this, like it's in like the edge of the galaxy. Nobody knows, you know, backwater. nobody comes here. It's, it's totally backwater. Right. But if you watch anything Star Wars, you'd see it's like the most important city in the whole universe. Cause there's always stuff here. Like everything's here. So I, yeah, I guess it's a bit of a nostalgia play, but whatever it is, what it is. I uh, guess so. Yeah. I mean, what can you say? You kind of have to have it in there because, well, everybody knows what it is and they, you know, in a game like this, you kind of might want to visit it, but I yeah, get exactly no. what you're saying. It's the, it's the back world, the backwater planet that's so obscure that uh, they could hide Luke Skywalker there under his own name. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody would notice. And of course, Obi-Wan's there as well. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's, it's... He just happens to be there too, huh? Yep. Yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I am interested to see what they end up doing with this gameplay wise, because. Uh, you know, well, there had been previews this week, right? And uh, um, there were some uh, pushback. There were some complaints that it was perhaps too much like Uncharted, which is kind of weird because the trailer footage doesn't really... I mean, you like can see Uncharted? elements. Yeah, that's really? what yeah. people said. But it's weird because mm-hmm. it doesn't look like that in the trailer at all. I think it was maybe a curated run-through. And... Wait, wait. That just massively boosted my excitement then. Because I actually <laughs> like Uncharted versus like other UV open world games usually. So like that's that's awesome. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, oh. I guess it is just the way they curated that particular content. Because if you have got a vast open world game, then you kind of I, don't want to just give that to people for a, I can know, s- 10 minutes hands on. Or whatever. I can see what, th- what they would mean then based on the combat footage where she's infiltrating that little compound yeah. where you're talking about shadows. That is Uncharted style kind of stealth and action stuff. Which yeah, I think I'd is agree an, with that. An awesome fit. That's a really great fit for a game like this. Like I, I, I can't imagine seeing that as a complaint. I don't. I really don't get that. That's mm-hmm. a really great thing. Yeah, uh, absolutely. The mechanics look solid, and that's so. And that's another thing is that this is this is a massive game, right? Yeah. Both in ter- both in terms of development and size, ah. I'd imagine. <laughs> uh Avatar, weirdly enough, I thought was like the best thing, the best open world game Ubisoft has probably released in like a decade. It it was genuinely really well done. Yeah, uh, it had it definitely had some Ubi-isms. parts where it was padded. It was padded out a little bit in some areas, but I feel like the overall design was extremely compelling and really well done. And I I feel like Massive has become their somewhat of a rising star for Ubisoft. They're making their most interesting and best games now, I would argue. Mm-hmm. So just given that pedigree and what we're seeing here and hearing as people talk about those mechanics, this does seem like this could be genuinely uh, an amazing title. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But Alex, this is like Avatar Snowdrop, right? Which right. is to say cutting edge, state of the art, ray tracing, the whole package basically yeah so and the the, what that's one of the reasons why i think they're trying to show off console footage here is because we know they're not showing off the full graphical package that they've announced like there's shadow maps all over the place here uh the pc version if they were showing that off they would presumably be showed off with the stuff that well the pc version won't have shadow maps on its highest settings it'll use ray trace shadows um based upon the nvidia press brief and the this trailer there so there's that that i thought was interesting but nonetheless there was an interesting moment uh i'm going to go back to the the sneaking around part there where at like once again at 704 when i showed off that i said oh k's shadow the main character's shadow is kind of low res there but interestingly her shadow is like intersecting it's like sharp edged with a shadow from like the the mountain or hill behind her that is very soft uh, and usually that implies some form of penumbra shadow is in usage there. And I found that interesting because that's actually something that isn't in uh, uh, Avatar at all. Uh, Avatar just had like really standard shadow maps and then distant shadows were done a different way and terrain shadows were done a different way. Uh, but I thought, I thought that was interesting because either that's a tech upgrade or just some sort of visual artifact that uh, makes the game look like it has physically based penumbra shadows, which was kind of cool. Okay. Uh, another thing that I noticed is that uh, at 2.20, uh, when uh, Kay gets on our ship, uh, there are, like, one thing that um, 
uh, Avatar didn't have was it didn't have reflections on glass from RT, and they used real-time cube maps, which was interesting. Uh, here, uh, when she gets in the ship, at least from the inside perspective of the ship, doesn't look like there's any reflections on the glass at all, and that surprised me a bit. So I'm curious I see, I see, what they're going to be doing I definitely see there. what looks looks cube mappy when she runs right up to it. You see something sort of sheen off the glass. Does That's, it not so uh, change at all? I'm presuming it doesn't line up with anything. Yeah, and there's also the uh, the noisy uh, lens flares there too. Yeah, not so not so hot those lens flares in terms of how stable they are. Uh, yeah. And the last thing I wanted to comment on, uh, other than that, there's a lot of obvious scenes in the game here. Like there's one section once again when she's sneaking and they find her. Like the, a door opens up and you can see the light spill into the room, which I thought looked really great. There's also like a red awning above, uh, which is actually bouncing red light on the scenery around it in that exact and same also, scene. And also, nec- right next to that, where it really shows the benefits here of this uh, GI solution, where you see like the occlusion shadow kind of around the frame of the door, right? But in the area that's fully lit by the sun, there's no such thing. If this was right. just SSAO, you would you would see that occlude. You'd have occlusion shadows everywhere, regardless. It would just look like an outline shader again. <laughs> yeah, and one thing that I know from their presentations uh, at GDC is that they're actually changing the GI for this game specifically because the probe system that they had as the fallback uh, for Avatar has issues with large indoor scenes. Uh, which Avatar doesn't have, and it also has issues with aligning with small, thin walls. So oh. all of these structures are small, thin walled structures, something that is really not in Avatar at all. And uh, so they have, they're they having to change it to to accommodate this world. So they're all already doing bespoke stuff for just this game. But one thing that I wanted to point out that I still don't think looks great, but I don't feel like it, I care at all, but it is a little bit off-putting is that the cutscene animations, sometimes like the character, like the main character at 944, when she talks to this sheriff or whomever, uh, like the, the character model is a good looking character model, but like when it starts animating in these cutscenes and starts talking, it just looked, it looked so awkward. <laughs> Um, I don't know if you can present that in a different way where you don't have to show the character talking so much. Maybe you just keep it behind like the character, like you only see the back of the character's head. So you don't actually have to see them talking or something like that. Do like, like an AB shot to avoid it. Um, but it, I think whenever they show the main character talking in this game, in the last couple trailers, it hasn't looked too great and it almost looks uncanny. And I, that's one thing where I, it's hard to file the game for that because I actually don't want devs to spend too much money on useless cinematics that do not necessarily enrich the whole experience. But uh, it is a little awkward given how everything else I think looks really, really, really great. Okay. Yep. Cool. Mm-hmm. Agreed. Yeah. I guess that's everything we got to say about Outlaws then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I sure. Say. That's all for we right have to say about that. <laughs> well, hopefully we'll get to. Uh, have a closer encounter with the game. I don't know when it's coming out. Though. It's fairly soon, uh, isn't it? I think it's August 20th or something like that. It's like August, August late 30th. August. Oh, my God. So it's it's right around Jeez. a billion it's other true. games. We got Black Myth Wukong. We got Stalker 2. We got Space Marine 2. We got... That's like all there. It's all... It's. I have no idea what we're going to do. Uh, <laughs> cry. <laughs> oh. Clone myself. Uh, that's what it's I really be awesome. want. I mean... Um, you know, the stuff we've seen in terms of NVIDIA um, enhancements, I'm also looking forward to as well. Mm-hmm. It should be pretty, pretty cool. Okay, um, I think we got uh, enough to say about that. Let's move on. Okay, so uh, the second major piece of uh, hashtag content within Ubisoft Forward was a more extended um, look at Assassin's Creed Shadows. More specifically, we actually got to see the proper game as opposed to just some fairy tale CG nonsense that they chose to reveal the game with. And guess what? It actually looks really terrific to the point where, guess what? You really didn't need to have a CG uh, cinematic to reveal the game. No. Um, Plenty to talk about here. John, do you want to kick off on this one? Sure, yeah. So we're looking at Ghost of Tsushima 2 here. And uh, (laughs) it's... Assassin's Creed Tsushima, as Oliver called it. Yes, exactly. So I, I want to start by complimenting them on their rendering of a forest. That initial scene as he rides into town makes a strong impression just in terms of overall geometric density, variety of foliage types, the lighting through there. Everything's really impressive. Noticeably better than 
I guess any prior Assassin's Creed game. And that makes sense because I think this is the first time we're getting an AC game made specifically for the current generation of consoles. So there yeah. is no last gen version, which I think is great. Uh, we're still seeing things like SSR is obviously in full effect as he rides into village. And there's definitely still some thing like criticisms with the visuals, but I think by and large, they've done a really good job of sort of creating this vast detailed landscape that feels detailed off into the distance rather than just in the near field. So yep. that, that is extremely promising. Uh, the character models and such up close still have that kind of heavily normal mapped look. That's just, you know, it's kind of just how, how it rolls, but mm-hmm. <laughs> That's kind of a bummer. Uh, but the actual, I guess the thing I'm not clear on, though, is how the uh, the the overall design of the game is going to be. We'll get more into that as well, though. I'm just skipping through the trailer right now. Mm-hmm. I like this, uh, this section where he engages enemies in the middle of the town. That's the cool because part for I, me. Yeah. That's uh, right about at 350 or so. And there's actually enough, like physical interactions with things in the environments like when he smashes a foe and they go f- flying through like a crate of uh there's tomatoes apples some sort of i think some sort of or the apple sorry yeah <laughs> exactly some sort of vegetable there collected and there's just enough little interactions with that and also the way the enemies react to his large club like weapon is satisfying and it feels like they actually have proper animations and weight as they hit one another so the, I think this looks noticeably nicer in motion during combat mm. and the level of interactivity and the amount of stuff in the scene is cool because obviously when you, when you go back to some of the older games, they could be very beautiful, but they were extremely static, right? Mm-hmm. We love to talk about Assassin's Creed unity, but which was that amazing baked lighting, but because it's so baked, the game world had to essentially become completely static because any dynamic objects would not fit in all that well with the way they set it up yeah. for scenery anyway. Right. And obviously with their current solution here, and this is the latest version of Anvil, I guess. Mm-hmm. Anvil, yeah, they, I do think. they specify it? It's like Anvil next to next. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. They just called it the know. Assassin's Creed. Like they said uh, in the quote, like the first time, uh, sorry, quoting off quoting someone from Twitter here, the first time, Ray Trace Global Illumination has been in an Assassin's Creed game. I don't think they actually said Anvil. Oh, they didn't say the they didn't say Anvil. Believe. But that might uh, be my mistake. Um, but yeah, that's interesting. There is stuff to talk about with ray tracing, but another thing I did notice that bummed me out a little bit is that uh, after finally adding in per object motion blur, uh, they've now taken it away. <laughs> and uh, okay. all these animate so when you the game is obviously being shown here at 30 frames per second. 30 FPS without motion blur just doesn't look that good, I would say. Mm-hmm. It, it makes everything look much more stuttery and game-like in a way that I'm surprised they have not implemented that or continued to implement that in their games with this one. Yeah. Obviously, that was a big part of the Star Wars presentation, but it's just not here. <laughs> <laughs> I, I feel like it's a... a like. I would assume it's still in there. Uh, it was in their Mirage, too. Um, and it, it's a little, like John said, I think it makes this presentation look less smooth than it should be, especially in like the combat when you select, when you, when this, your main character there, I forget the name of the character. Uh, he's really tall and he has long arms and he's got a huge, uh, massive like span as a result of this massive club. When that swings the arc across the screen, it, like every frame is probably like, hundreds of pixels away from each other as a result of that and if there's no smear exactly. in between the frames it actually makes it look really stuttery and i think that's a something you wouldn't want to do also when they're approaching town or later on when uh they're showing the secondary character whose name i also don't know but the woman uh well, she does some pretty big acrobatic stuff and that all that stuff like the animations are great yep, yep, but yep, yep, you know yep. 30 fps large movement looks stuttery so I would highly recommend them to show this off with motion blur, actually. I always have a large movement after playing a game without motion blur. But anyway, <laughs> um, I really like the uh, the the lighting here because, as you, as they said, it is they've actually switched to an RTGI solution, which is great, but also probably explains why it's presented at 30 frames per second. 
Which right. again, mo- motion blur, come on. Uh, <laughs> but I actually especially liked the night sequence. So the second scene where she's sort of taking on this temple area. Uh, doing night scenes is obviously a difficult thing. And I feel like having a, an area bathed in fog and darkness and then presenting like little canisters of flames and lights and torches all over the place always produces a nice striking presentation. It should look amazing in HDR. But it also, with their current lighting solution, <clears throat> I don't know if they're actually able to do, like, have, have they specified whether it's, um, whether they're doing, like, per light sort of GI or if it's actually just, like, just the sun or, well, you know, because, like, you remember, like, the two kernels, when the two kernels got together, right? we got that massive boost in, in Metro Exodus's, uh, yeah. Right or, or that was that for that? Yeah, that was in the two kernels. Yeah, the missive lighting right. and whatnot. Uh, so, based upon what we know, uh, and based upon what I see in this trailer, and Oliver has a video coming out about this too in his own right. But uh, here, I want to say that this is using what is called RTX GI or DDGI, where it yeah, only DDGI. Aff- it only affects the diffuse portion of lighting, so no reflections really. That's what it looks like, at least. Uh, and then also that's probe based. So, uh, really good shot of this, I think, is when you're in that town area that we were talking about earlier. If you look at the individual objects that are in shadowed regions, they don't have that look of per pixel RTGI that you get no, from like Lumen. Right. And so, and they remind me more of stuff I've seen in other games that use DDGI. So that's what I think with regards to that. And that, that would have knock on effects. One, it's, it's cheaper to run. So, that's good. Uh, Lumen is obviously super expensive and things like that are super expensive. Uh, but also it would mean that smaller objects can be a bit more disconnected from the scene. Uh, and I think that's kind of what we're seeing here, but we'll have to wait to see what the game looks like when it comes it's, out. Yeah. I mean, it's still better than having fully baked out lighting like AC Unity, for instance, or their prior solution. I think this is still an improvement, but yeah, I agree. It does with that. still, there's still things that have sort of a glowy look to them mm-hmm. that don't yeah. quite connect to the scene. To lend credence mm-hmm. to it as well, too, Skull and Bones, which is an Anvil game, uh, weirdly enough, uh, is i forgot about that yeah uh that game on pc and console on the 30 fps mode has ddgi but it only applies to the ship in a really weird way uh (laughs) yeah yeah it's gi that only applies to a ship which is like one part of this tiny open world uh that you can't even like really see up close it's so funny um and yeah so maybe this is like they worked that into this game in a different way uh the speaking of uh things that are like half confirmed that was confirmed on twitter but another thing that was uh leaked a while back it might have been from the famous infamous tom henderson i don't recall who actually leaked it but then it was like confirmed on twitter and then deleted was that the game will be maybe using virtualized geometry and that uh virtualized geometry is like at least based upon that wording is akin to what nanite does where yeah. You are only streaming in uh, the relevant uh, parts of the geometry that you need in for the object based upon its like pixel size, uh, and that's what it sounds like. It can mean other things too. Where like in Nanite Two, they also have continuous LOD as a part of that, where it's not only based upon like it's not only streaming in what you need based upon the pixel size, but it's changing every frame and it's doing it in a way that is invisible to the human eye when it changes. And that's what makes Nanite really special, I think, because you get closer to an object and you don't notice it flipping between discrete level of details. And in this trailer, when watching through it, there is actually a lot of, um, I wouldn't call it LD pop, but there is a lot of how do you call it uh draw distance pop in so like small objects when the main character is riding towards the town you'll see things like hanging fish in the market popping up or something like that or just like random little things in the game world popping up uh but maybe it's applying to things on screen that i wasn't paying attention to but if that is in the game but that's one thing that when as we get closer to release i think this based upon how big of a difference this is visually from the previous Assassin's Creed games, especially Valhalla, which I didn't actually like visually, um, nope. I think uh, this deserves a great tech eye on the channel uh, yeah. to see what it's like. I would mm-hmm. say, Alex, uh, while there is definitely some visible pop, 
that's one area that's still drastically improved. Like when right. he rides down into that town, like it, it is largely stable and grass is right. visible far out into the distance. So I'll be curious to see more about how they actually do this, but at least it is more temporarily stable overall compared to any prior Assassin's yeah. Creed game. And we are just talking about Unity, right? Uh, just sorry, yep. Rich. Uh, yeah, Unity, had, we love all... that game, but like, uh, it's it's one thing that I wish that the, it had like a like an ultra max setting for LOD because the LOD is really short in Unity. That's one Very thing that aggressive. it's super aggressive. It's one of the more distracting aspects if you play it today. Mm-hmm. Um, one thing that sort of struck uh, me is, uh, I mean, this is a really cool. Uh, innovation you know it's definitely different to what they've done before they really have put a lot of effort into this to the point where take away the HUD elements just watch the gameplay and maybe you wouldn't even know that it's an Assassin's Creed game you know it's very very different to what they've done before I think that's that's really impressive um I st- but you know we keep talking about unity whenever we talk about Assassin's yeah. Creed and uh I, I miss that I really do <laughs> I want to see if they use this engine on that kind of on that kind of game on that kind of experience in that kind of city. I just think it would be just epic. So the the campaign continues for the mm. uh, remaster slash remaster remake enhance. Yeah, if you can what? do a Stadia port years after the game came. Out. <laughs> exactly. I forgot about that, Rich. Holy <laughs> <Yeah>. crap! <laughs> it exists. It is. It is. Uh, it is there. That's it great. can be rebuilt. I forgot it. What did it, what did that run like? Uh, it was um, thirty FPS with uh, inconsistent frame pacing, I believe. But it was. It was like the game. It was Assassin's Creed Unity. They brought it's it nice. back. Yeah. <laughs> I forgot so, about that. My goodness. One other little thing I liked in this trailer that I did want to mention is right around. Um, 956 they hmm. showed it several times where they have the shadows of enemies and objects sort of like filtered through the paper screen doors oh, that's uh, great. Uh, within the compound uh, obviously they use it as a game mechanic you can sort of attack somebody that's standing in the other room but it does actually seem to line up with live objects so it's not just like a, a fake thing and it's mm-hmm. it's neat looking i think just mm-hmm. having those sort of shadows through the doors and you, you see it a lot after that point you can even see trees and other things like casting shadows that become diffuse on that sort of uh paper door all right which uh i can't recall seeing anything quite like that before an ass creed uh yeah, I that, definitely that, don't that whole scene that whole last sequence is cool it, it's i like the way it looks at night i like that i think it's a really cool scene and it reminded me more of something like a, a tenchu game the tenchu game we haven't had forever i love <laughs> I, I used to love those tenchu games yeah. those, those were a lot of fun uh and uh yeah this is this reminds me of that in a positive way yeah Yeah, i think it looks terrific i think it's going to be huge i do wonder though do you think well there's going to be a clamor for a 60 fps performance mode might be one i don't know we don't know yet that's, we don't. But the one what, thing, though, how do you rate the chances, chances <laughs> Alex? The one reason why I, I'm a little bit worried about it is because I let, last time we saw Anvil, I know Skull and Bones is not a great example, but that 60 FPS mode was rough visually. Um, but one thing that Skull and Bones didn't really have that this has is like a super, like I actually thought the the marketplace was had a lot of NPCs in it. Yeah. And that was the one thing that I feel like sometimes the last couple of Assassin's Creed's Right. They got people, but I don't know. This seems like really dense in terms of people. So I'd be curious if there was like a, a a crowd density slider on the PC version that they would maybe use to scale to get 60 FPS on console. <laughs> yeah, I saw that scene, Alex, and I just thought to myself, well, uh, what's the betting that this is going to be a new CPU benchmark? <laughs> yeah, that's what I, I immediately saw that. I was like, I could no. literally feel the, the heat <laughs> coming from the CPU. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> ACPU benchmark. Well, so the trailer was presented at 30 and it was 4K 30 on YouTube and not in a 60 yep, hertz yep, container. Yep. And that's one thing that also worried me a bit because, I mean, this, this, so the, the trailer was 30 FPS, but it also had like noticeable like hitches when stuff was going like moving around the area. And I'm always a little bit worried about that because in the past, Assassin's Creed games, some of them have been better on the CPU than others, but I distinctly recall odyssey when you'd run around in that game on middling cpus you definitely get big stutters uh and you know i have no idea what platform this was but let's hope that this game has great consistent frame times on the cpu and we've also we've been here before where i mean obviously 
uh, Assassin's Creed Unity that we keep talking about was the first time they made the jump to PS4 and Xbox One exclusively, right. even though it was only one year later. But uh, AC4 on those machines was technically very, very solid. It launched mm-hmm. in a great state and had a ton of, ton of cool features. And then when they made that leap, it didn't quite work out initially, as we know. So hopefully that this does not suffer a similar fate. Yeah. Uh, there is one other thing I noticed. Did you see that part about 11.25 in the trailer when she's swimming in the water? All like the, the, the plant life, the lily, lily pads, as the camera moves around, they like just get removed from view, yes. like very near near the camera in a way that remind me of, of playing like an emulated GameCube game and you use like the, uh, the widescreen mode, you know? And it's like the occlusion calling system is designed for four by three. So when you force it to 16 by nine, widen, it's just, you see stuff clipping it down. But I will say then, right after that, it looks a bit messy, but he she gets into combat and slices through a whole bunch of bamboo stalks. Yeah. And they all kind of tumble down but, in a very yeah. messy way, but then they also just disappear. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, there's also, they released a cinematic trailer using as for certain, you know, like a like a supercut of the game. And right. when the, she cuts down the bamboo stalks, they're like, I don't know, the way they move... They they remind like you know how like they don't physicalize and like turn but they all move while no. standing vertically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. kind of jitter. Yeah, it, <laughs> yeah, it looks it looks really funny. Um, but you know that's also we haven't seen that in a lot of games, so I'll, I'm forgiving. Nope. I also like right after that she climbs up the the wall of the castle and they actually draw sort of little rain droplets streaming off the roof tiles themselves along with the rain, which mm-hmm. I thought was a nice touch. It gives the game this like sort of soaked look which is cool. Uh, cool. So th- there's a lot of nice little touches here. It's, it's, it's a handsome looking game. Mm-hmm. Uh, but man, please, please b- bring back the motion blur guys. Come on. <laughs> At least as an option. Always as an option. They've got until November the 15th to do it, which is the release date. Oh, thank which God. Which is cool. At least it's not in uh, September like every other game <sighs> is. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, <laughs> I'm grateful for that. We'll have like a small little respite and then probably a whole bunch of end of the year stuff including this game fair enough okay um i guess that's all we're going to say about this one for now i've got a video from oliver coming on that so i'm looking forward to seeing that let's move on let's go back to the xbox showcase and uh the gears of war e-day uh trailer that we saw uh immediately afterwards there seemed to be an incredible kerfuffle about the uh, the nature of the trailer uh, jeff Keeley getting in there talking about cg assets other people saying it's not CG, but fully real time. I think uh, I did watch the segment that you guys did, and I think you got uh, the details broadly right mm-hmm. about what the nature of this trailer and what it actually is. Um, I guess when I was um, watching this drama play out, I hadn't actually seen the asset, but you know, I was just thinking to myself, if it's real time, if it's Unreal Engine 5, again, why not show the game? <laughs> you know, it just seems obvious. Um, but uh, I guess you guys wanted to quickly sort of clarify what we were seeing or, or, or discuss yeah. various aspects, but uh, go for it, Alex. So from my perspective, I think the way it was described is that this is done the same way the advertising was done for Gears 1 through 3. So the original yeah. the original uh, Mad World trailer, for example, is a great example of that. Uh, gear, we know what Gears of War looks like. John and I just covered it. It's fun. Yeah. But you go to that uh, you go to that Mad World trailer, and it's an Unreal Engine cinematic. It's a the ability in Unreal Engine, which John has done for his videos before, where you have the ability uh, to render it out as a sequence. And it is actually something that can run in real time in your viewport, or even if you wanted, you could run it in real time. And I think that's what we're seeing here. It it can run in real time, but they rendered it out as a sequence using Unreal Engine 5 so that it's a video that runs at 30 FPS and doesn't have any skips and tears, anything like that, and has really smooth camera and all that jazz. Uh, So that's what I think we're looking at here. But other than that, I actually do think it is uh, uh, Blur made it, Blur Studios, who does incredible work. Uh, some of the best pre-rendered cinematics you've ever seen are from Blur. And I think what it is, is that we're just seeing the in-game assets there just rendered out, uh, you know, like at a perfect 4K. And that's really it. I didn't see anything when we watched the trailer other than the moment John pointed out where the the bayonet flashes light at the character's face, Marcus's face. 
which can be faked in a, a lot of ways. I think everything else there actually did look like something you could see running in real time in, yep. in a way. So I, I just wanted to clarify that from our perspective that I actually have a good enough trust as well in the coalition to present the game in a way that is going to be realistic to the end product. Because actually, they always show off stuff that looks really, really good and ends up looking really, really good. So, yeah. yeah. I think it's as you say, Alex, it's probably more of just like an image quality boost and to get something out that looks pristine, even if it is rendered in the engine, it's a good way to get like a perfect version of that asset. Right. Because I suspect image quality wouldn't necessarily be quite as good as we see in this trailer. I'd but agree with everything, that. Everything else seems very realistic and, and very likely, in fact. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, obviously, it, it's, it, yeah, the qual I'm, I'm literally watching it now for the first time because I've been away. And the quality level is just off the charts here to the point where I would mistake it for, uh, uh, well, it is a pre-rendered asset effectively, isn't it? Right. It is within yeah. the engine. It is using um, assets from the game, but I'm not sure whether there's a computer in existence that would be running this in real time <laughs> at that fidelity level. Which is what I yeah, want to point out. Like, like you, I could see this at like 1080p. It's on some GPU out there, but like at a at real 4K, some of the it looks great, especially like the the overarching shot of the city. Like I think Unreal yeah. can do really great um, small scenes and add a high frame rate. But as soon as you start looking over the city, it's like my goodness, that is that's a, like even the Matrix demo goes to a HLOD at the distance to right. preserve memory and frame rate. And there's a lot of things where you'd imagine, especially if this is targeting Series X, um, which they already announced, uh, you know, like some of the details there. Yeah. if I'm curious to see, though, if this cutscene ends up in game in some form or if this is right. just like the original um, Mad World trailer where none of that's actually in game. No, mm. not at all. Yeah. Yeah. The Mad World trailer had further enhancements as well over, like it had that full puddle of like high quality reflections where Marcus looks down into the water, right? It, it has that shadow was, maps and stuff too. It has too. perfect shadows in there. Uh, Pierce doesn't have that. Like none of that stuff's <laughs> actually in the game, right? Yeah. Uh, and stuff like the, like I think there could be some amazing destruction in here, but I'm skeptical of the quality of the destruction when the building collapses in this trailer. Mm -hmm. It's just a bit beyond, you know, you can do some Alembic stuff that looks similar enough, but just the fidelity of it is so high that I'm skeptical that that's feasible in mm -hmm. real time right now. Yeah. It, so I don't know. It'll be curious. The blog did mention next generation destruction and a dismemberment. Okay. I guess, it, right. <sighs> There's a, I don't know. One thing that we've seen with UE5 is it has this chaos physics system, but no game has used it yet. <laughs> uh, I don't know why, uh, but uh, so there's a lot we haven't seen. It has the ability to like fracture stuff. It has the ability to do like stuff that you haven't seen in games f in a really long time or ever. You know, game's done it, but Coalition are masters of their craft. I'm willing yep. to, at least for this, give them the benefit of the doubt for a while. Okay, well, we've got Absolutely. this uh, supporter question from Kenneth Bergen. Uh, hello, lads. <laughs> Do you think the coalition should have labeled the Gears of War E Day trailer, quote unquote, pre rendered using in game assets? Does the labeling matter in the current year? Is it perhaps a little deceiving to label it in game when that will undoubtedly lead a lot of viewers to assume it's running in real time on consumer hardware? From what I understand, the trailer presented is more similar to the pre rendered with in game assets cutscenes of your before everything went real time. I kind of wish everything had gone real time, but anyway, in the here and now, does any of this matter? Where's my mom and dad? Jeez, my dudes. <laughs> Where's my mom and dad? Um, I just think. Um, I just really, whatever in the engine pops up as a as a subtitle, I just internally groan and think, you know, okay, this is something that we're not actually going to see in game to that level right. of fidelity. Therefore, what is the point? Um, and the fact that so much, of the, you know, the fact that they've gone to so many lef uh, lengths to actually present uh, uh, a video here that is using actual in game assets. I, why not show the game? I can only assume the game's not ready to be shown or something like that. Um, but even so, I'm just, just sort of baffled by this sort of stuff. And it kind of takes the sheen off because it's the coalition. It's, you know, you know, this is going to be an awesome game. Maybe it was just too early to show. I don't know. But even so, you know, um, this whole sort of concept of in-engine, I just don't really like it at all. 
What can I say? I, uh, I, I agree with that. I'd vastly prefer it said in game running on Xbox Series X or running on PC, which, you know, well, Microsoft even does as, anyway. As Kenneth here says pre rendered using in game assets. At least that's sort of being fully transparent about what you're actually seeing. I mean, mm-hmm. in engine can literally mean anything. You could have, like, you know, each frame taking 24 hours to render it <laughs> if you really wanted to. Yeah, pre rendered in engine with in game assets. This is it's a sentence, but it at least is super descriptive, you know? Yeah, or, or as I think it's, you know, the Sony. Um, presentations they typically just go straight for the jugular not actual gameplay you know, <laughs> stuff like that <laughs> okay uh, let's move on to the next topic wow this one's uh, really interesting so um, it turns out that there seems to have been some massive leak of the Epic's game, Epic Game Store database uh, it's a new prophecy it's Sweeney's prophecy Sweeney's prophecy and uh, it seems to be uh, indicating a huge bunch of games that are going to be coming out, which, uh, well, let's be honest, I'm looking at the stuff that's being mentioned here. It's nothing that I'm, that's going to be an earth-shattering surprise, is it? No. <laughs> but uh, yes. Um, Alex, do you want to take up the story on this one? So the idea is that, like SteamDB before it, uh, there's an API to plug into to get information uh, uh, out of epic game store and it it, no one since a lot of people don't actually care about epic game store not a lot of people have ever really looked into it and apparently it's been like a source where someone made a a db like the ability to search it and Mm. people have been using it to actually like uh like scrape leaks out of it kind of yeah without any uh, repercussion because no one was paying attention and then it came out right now as oh wait this exists and so it's going to be censored if it had already hasn't been. Um, but the idea is really interesting here because we got leaks like this in the past through SteamDB before it uh, or Steam Spy and all these other things. Bef- you know, And we also got the NVIDIA leak, which was grabbed in a similar way of just a database of things that you can just publicly read. And here, I think the the fun part of it, other than the fact that you know we have a new prophecy to talk about, <laughs> Uh, and always reference on the show, which, by the way, Jason Schreier said this morning, Final Fantasy Tactics Remake Remaster is real. Or was it yesterday? And guess what was in Jensen's Prophecy? That exact <laughs> same game. Jensen's Prophecy is like within the most oh. accurate leak in all video game history. It's incredible. Um, but uh, that's great. But here there's some really interesting entries. There was a Rockstar entry. I think it was named named after like a Swedish dessert of some sort uh okay. but the the file size associated with it was the same size of red uh dead redemption uh ps5 install size uh interestingly enough so that's probably the egs listing for red dead redemption remastered on pc uh which yep. i thought was great to there was see. another leak for that one as well from the epic uh, sorry the rockstar launcher Right. So, yeah, that that kind of makes sense. Just get it out there. Let's see. <laughs> uh, another one that was also in there, I think it was like Project Utah or something like that, which is The Last of Us Part Two, based upon the associations with it. Uh, there was also Rise of the Ronin coming to PC, but nice. that was named after a character in the game. Uh, so like if you like some of the namesings and listing one thing that you have to be worried about with all these leaks is that there's going to be false listings just because people do tests uh, often like there's some that are literally just named yeah. test but some of them are just named like random junk um, uh, there's also going to be the fact that projects will start having these uh, like depot listings made for them even though the project is canceled and we saw that in the past uh, a number of times with like the nvidia leak too there was titanfall 3 where it was obviously started at some point but then the game was canned uh similar to uh the, the, yeah that happens actually quite often that you hear about a game and then it just goes away but in this case there's probably a number of these listings from uh a variety of different publishing houses and developers that are not going to end up being anything at all. So don't try, look at all. There's a, there's a great listing online. You can find on Reddit of all these things. And a number of them are, end up going to be non attributable, but in the end here, uh, there's actually like, there's a lot of really great proof of really, uh, great games coming to PC in the near future. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm just enjoying the code names, which seem to be all based on various foodstuffs. <laughs> Ubisoft has food-themed ideas for its code names, says Eurogamer, including quote-unquote puff pastry and profitable. Uh, Saber Interactive has chimichanga. And, uh, Square, Square en Enix has butter caca. Yeah, but which uh, I, I don't want it's that. A, it's apparently a, oh, it's no. apparently a butter cake. But the name, when you say it in English or any oh, other language, it just yeah. sounds like diarrhea, man. That's, that's, that's what it sounds like to me. You, you went there, Alex. I did say. go for the D word. Yeah. Um, he loves the D word. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that that means a whole other bunch of things. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I'm I'm excited to see what comes of this. I'm a little bit sad though that it came out in the way it did because now there's not going to be any more access to it like it there is with the, all these leaks when they go live and viral. Uh but thank you uh Tim Sweeney for leaking all these games on PC. Personally leaking all the <laughs> Yes. <laughs> We sat down, made a prophecy, it turned into code. Yeah. And here we are. <laughs> <laughs> speaking in tongues or something like that that explains all the names right yeah i mean there's i mean wow i'm just looking at this uh re reset era uh thread of like all of these code names which is provoking various discussions there man mm. that's going to be pretty damaging for uh for epic though on the on the more serious side uh, anything to add to that john Oh, not really. I mean, it's just another one of these prophecies, and we can only hope that it truly holds to be as accurate as uh, Jensen's. Okay, fair enough. Uh, let's move on. Uh, final news topic of the week. Um, a demo came out for Riven. Um, John, you've been playing it. Why don't you tell us what Riven oh, yeah. is? Why you're excited right. about it? So, okay, Riven is the sequel to Myst, and Myst was at one point the most successful PC game in history at that point in time. It sold a lot of copies. It was a essentially a point-and-click adventure game played from the first person, built in hypercard, where you're navigating around this island, uh, solving obscure puzzles across ages through these books. And it was really well-loved for its storytelling atmosphere and what it was doing at the time. And it's continued to receive a lot of life. There's been many sort of re-releases of the original Mist. There was Real Mist, and then they built on Real Mist multiple times. There's even a Quest native uh, version of Mist you can play in your headset, which blew my mind at the time. Just the idea of putting on a headset and walking around Mist Island. Great stuff. But they had ambitions for the sequel, which the sequel, of course, being Riven, which was released later in the 90s. And... I think this one was a significant visual upgrade over the original still pre-rendered CGI, but like, obviously like their ability to do pre-renders massively improved and it looked awesome in those original shots. But then as Cyan went on, Cyan continued to make games. And even when they ventured into the world of real time, 3d graphics, which they've done many times, the games looked amazing, but you could still kind of, it never quite had that look of like, this looks like a pre-rendered game. Uh, until now, I feel like Riven, they've built this in Unreal Engine 5 and they're able to leverage some of those new technologies to create something that finally truly does to the eye look a lot. It looks like like real time versions of the original CGI uh, That's awesome. pieces of artwork. And that just to me, seeing that finally like running around in real time in that world was awesome it just it looks so freaking good has great hdr support as well uh it's just densely packed with detail everything is super like dense and rounded it just looks so smooth and it feels it feels modern yet it really recalls that original look in a way that really took me by surprise mm -hmm. uh, so i was super happy to see that it's also going to support vr um which is cool Wow, and I would also note that's what, what's interesting. Now, I want to explore more of this. Is that they they've actually it's not just like here's missed one or riven with one to one the original puzzles. The actual puzzles elements have changed, so the game itself is different. Mm -hmm. Which uh, I'm curious to see how that plays out. The only thing I would say it's not a it's not a huge criticism, but the character interactions in the game world in the original, of course, they used FMV characters, and the FMV was quite excellent. And we saw with uh, the seventh guest VR, they were able to essentially map FMV, like filmed characters onto like a 3D model of sort. 
but of course those were ghosts so you it kind of worked a little better here these are real people but they've essentially rendered them out with normal polygons and the models do look good although the animation of them seems to play at a lower rate than the frame rate on pc where huh. the game was running at like 120 fps no problem but like the the character animation was like at a slightly lower rate so that looked a little jarring i'm cur- i hope they can fix that cool. uh but the other th- the thing i'm really curious about though is that this is also receiving a native quest 3 version really Whoa. and, and it's I, 5 i don't know what that's going to be like what what the heck are they going to be able to do with that like that's a, that's asking a ton from a mobile chipset that has to display this at like a high frame rate uh, twice essentially so i'm i'm I genuinely sh- shockingly curious i i mean i want to know what that's going to mean because with the other thing like the mist thing for instance uh there were some changes of course but it looked reasonably like the the other versions that you you could get playing in pancake mode uh here though i just don't see it like i don't think you could pull this off on a headset at this fidelity so i'm kind of waiting for the final game to drop because i really just gotta know like how do you bring a game like this to a headset like that and have it look anything like what you're doing on the pc side and by the way the pc version supports vr as well not the demo but the final game will which means you could also just conceivably use it with the quest headset anyway yeah Uh, wow which seems like the better way to go but i guess for people that want the all-in-one experience i don't know we'll find out when it hits but this is going to be an interesting case of a game where they're shipping on two drastically different platforms like the gulf between these is so big in terms of potential power right right yeah. uh and we've not seen anything attempt to leverage ue5 features that then also show up on something like like a quest headset i wonder so, if they're just going to turn them off or something like you they, can turn off that i i've done it i, I you can <laughs> i wonder if they can make something that still manages to convey that look though like yeah I don't right know. Well, I'm back curious. in the day, um, there was like a round table, which I was at with uh, Tim Sweeney and some of the other Epic guys. It was when uh, Loom in the land of... Tim Sweeney. <laughs> before he made his prophecy. Made prophecy. <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, it was a round table. It was, it was around the time of Lumen in the land of Nanite, the original UE5 demo. And they were talking about the fact that, yeah, these projects are scalable. They can, there are going to be fallbacks. So I guess this is going to be the one, right? where that happens yep this could be the most extreme case we've seen yet i i'm curious because what happens to you if you turn off uh nanite right now i showed it off in i think it was my ue5 roundup video in like must have been october or november of last year where uh you get you can turn off nanite and it just uses the low res fallback mesh for nanite which for some objects can be fine but for some others it's not at all and it require it would require a hand tuned look to make it look right and ah man but also like you know this game john has like really great like to make it look that cg look it's got to have like super sharp shadows and mobile hardware just almost almost doesn't have shadows usually you know it's gonna be right, serious, right, right. curious to see how they even get this to scale exactly okay. yeah fair enough um fancy taking a look at this one once the game is complete john uh i will probably do something with it i think because it comes out very soon like oh, june cool. 20th or something isn't it i swear like in in like 10 days yeah so or maybe it's even earlier uh yeah. Yeah, I think yeah. it's. I think it'll be worth looking at just to because because of that gap beyond beyond everything. You know, that's one reason, of course. Everything else, like the game itself, is absolutely gorgeous. Uh, and realizing this in real time is something I've always wanted to see. So, mm-hmm. okay, cool. Uh, well, that's the end of the news this week, which means it's time to move on to uh, support a Q&A. Every week, I ask our users on the DF supporter program to put forth questions. Uh, for inclusion in the show and uh, we pick the best or other ones that we're best equipped to answer we never get around to answering all of them though so uh, we have our secondary supporter only show uh df indirect which uh, we post occasionally second episode up now uh, but let's go straight into the questions and uh, we're going to start with this one from concrete llama 
Has there ever been a more boring console generation than this one? Don't get me <clears> wrong, there are a lot of great games I'm excited to play, but we're four years in now. There's not much on the roadmap from Sony, and most of the Microsoft games shown had no release date attached. Kind of feels like we're going to finally see the potential of this gen, just as it's time to wind down, ready for the next gen. These consoles really haven't had many moments to shine. Uh, John, I can kind of see where he's coming from, right? Because um, cross-gen has kind of like uh, added massive friction to the development of gaming, right? Because, you know, people want to be able to uh, see a massive return on investment from ex really expensive games. And that kind of meant having to support as many systems as possible. But boring? What, what do you think? I don't, I don't think it's actually boring. I think the lineup of games is pretty good overall it's just that we've reached the point where so it used to be like with each new generation everybody was pushing the envelope of what you could do because the bar was very low on previous hardware so each new step was a gigantic leap it's no longer the case and it hasn't been for a while right there's a lot of new stuff you can do but actually taking advantage of the new stuff now requires a lot of resources which means that a lot of developers won't even be able to really take advantage of it in the first place right mm. which which is also why you can see why cross gen is stuck around so long because it's like well you can still do most of the stuff on on older machines so why not right yeah. uh but i think the actual num the quality of the games is largely pretty good i would say thus far um and more than anything else i would say it's been the most performant generation we've had since like the ps2 era where most games are 60 fps on mm. consoles now right like obviously some of these big ones are starting to not be 60 but by and large 60 is i would say it is it has become the standard we wanted right. uh, because that's just i'd say the overwhelming majority of games are just going to be 60 these days okay so uh which i think right there is is a pretty cool thing and it's only going to start to walk back a little bit as we see you know more titles releasing really pushing some of these new features and like unreal engine stuff and all that right mm -hmm. like then there's going to start to be more exceptions i suspect but for now i think it's been pretty good and uh it really is like it's like a continuation of the ps4 xbox one era in many ways but that's not really so is. bad not bad in terms of like actual entertainment right i think the larger problems just have to do with more it just it takes so much money and time and, and manpower to make stuff these days we've talked about this many times yeah so like you just can't have that old release schedule back again and due to that high cost everybody's incentivized to just continue to release on it every possible platform mm. yeah interesting i mean the point concrete llama is making about not much on the roadmap from sony kind of bears out just how difficult it is to make games and let's not forget that microsoft had its own uh empty period yeah. Uh, last year, where there wasn't really that much going on. It's just part and parcel of the way game development has, has kind of shifted. It's just massively more difficult than it was. Uh, Alex, any thoughts? Boring? Are you bored? Oh. The, well, the, if I, if I only paid attention to just like massive AAA things, I'd probably be bored just because there's not a lot of titles. If you're just looking for like exclusives to each platform, you may be bored. Um, because there hasn't been so many, they take longer to make, and due to their, John, like talking about them being expensive, uh, I think there is a large, like one thing that you didn't get in like the double AA, A, triple A space in PS2 and early Xbox 360, PS3, was there was less homogenization of gameplay types and theming and a variety of things. I definitely would say that modern triple A games are a lot more homogenized in terms of what you can expect when you play them. Uh, and interactivity is, you know, we've talked a lot about it before, where games are less interactive in the AAA space than they've possibly ever been since a long time now. Uh, so, like, uh, you know, I think if you're only paying attention to those spheres of games, you, you could be bored. But I think there's a lot richer games out there. You just don't only follow the large AAA exclusives and then you, you can really find your niche and fall in love with a whole bunch of different games. Okay, fair enough. Um, 
Let's move on. This question from Ben Woods. Uh, while the Xbox showcase was great, I can't help but feel that showing games including Flight Simulator 2024, Stalker 2, Perfect Dark, running at 60 FPS with pristine image quality is misleading. Are we actually going to have this experience on the Xbox Series X, or is Microsoft secretly showing PC versions of the games? John? Uh, I think they're secretly showing PC secretly. versions of games. Uh, I don't know. It's um, This is tricky, actually. I would say, though, in the case of Perfect Dark specifically, uh, since I'm looking closely at that, that's one where, I mean, it's clearly a vertical slice piece, but that definitely does not have pristine image quality, nor does it actually run at a perfect 60 FPS, which actually right. makes it feel a little bit more realistic. Um, I, I'll say it in the video, of course, but the resolution is not 4K most of the time anyway. Okay. Uh, and also the frame rate, especially as things heat up, it starts to dip into the 50s. Uh, I can't, it's too compressed to run through our tools necessarily, but just going frame by frame, there's plenty of duplicate frames that appear in that footage. So it's definitely dipping. And there's also some things where like, uh, I was kind of joking with Alex, like they do like a flash grenade kind of thing at one point. And during that huge flash, uh, because it's like a drastic change between one frame to the next, it sort of breaks the TAA apart and you can really see the image quality kind of crumble, but that also allows you to see like, oh, this is the actual pixel count currently in use. And it highlights some of the limitations, like a lot of the dynamic lights when they show up, they're not shadow casting, for instance. Like there's a lot of stuff going on in that that feels conservative enough where I could say like, hey, that's possibly like they could have they could have made that trailer using a console. I might still question that just because it is probably easier to make such a trailer on a PC directly, just in terms of like production of the asset itself. But there's nothing about it that says, oh yeah, this wouldn't work on an Xbox. It absolutely feels legit. Okay. Stalk Stalker 2 though, Flight Sim, stuff like that. Very likely those were made on PC, I would say. If I had to guess. I, don't, I mean, Alex, what do you think? 100%. Yeah. <laughs> they were made on a PC. And I, I would just like to say that in the past, I think it's a little bit annoying from Microsoft to show off PC footage and just keep using this Xbox phrase everywhere. And like, like the way they talk about PC is a bit like, it just makes us a lot of money and it's actually super important but the real thing we got to care about is the console fanboy feeling so everything's got to be xbox focused like i do find it a bit annoying considering how pc is microsoft's bread and butter that they don't like explicitly talk about it nearly enough as i really wish they would because pc gamers are excited about their platform they love it and then it just always being like the like second bullet point on a list in a bunch of stuff and not being expressly targeted like in a way like with messaging i find that just like a bit annoying uh, after it's been like it's been like this for like 10 years <laughs> now uh, uh or even longer like obviously during the 360 period it was way different uh but you know like now they've released everything on pc they got to start talking about it in a way that's like super exciting especially if the next Xbox is more like a PC, right? So I, th right. I think they gotta, they gotta get that hype about PC because Flight Sim is super hype on PC. People love that, that, that game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so hype it up. Be like, this game is gonna crush your PC. It's gonna look gorgeous. <laughs> You've never seen it before yeah. in your life. And say, dude, be, be out there about it. Be about, be about PC. It's fun. I will say though, um, from from what I've understood of the process for submitting things to the other manufacturers, there are much stricter requirements on this. Like I think for Sony, you really have to be very clear what the version is in that f video. So if it is PC, it needs to be labeled as such. And I believe Nintendo is so strict that you basically you have to show switch footage. Uh, you, you're not, you're not technically supposed to show anything other than actual switch capture. And Funny. if you do, you're basically breaking their, their, uh, somewhat, what they requirements. Somewhat ironic, bearing in mind some of their antics. Yes. I, I know what you mean, but yeah, it's, that's, that's what they seem to require from third parties. When you get shown in like a Nintendo direct I mean, or something, it's like, you need to be able to, it needs to be legit switch footage. Right. It needs to be a... Uh, and well, if it's it, not, well, you better hope that they think it is, I guess. <laughs> I'd just like to see a little uh, caption pop up at the bottom of the disclosure caption. It just says, too big for Switch. Yeah. Too big for Switch. Quote. <laughs> Question mark. Um, 
Well, I, I just we've, we've been saying this for years now. I mean, um, Microsoft every year seems to be edging ever closer to actual proper disclosure. I mean, this year they were talking yep. about, um, you know, in-game, in-engine, whatnot. But, you know, Sony just know what they're doing with it. Everything has to be captured on a PlayStation 5. And if not, they tell you, even to the point where, you know, stuff that looks like gameplay that but isn't gameplay, you get a little caption that pops up saying not actual gameplay. This is done presumably um, for legal reasons. Right. And I would suspect that uh, at some point somebody is going to get pulled up on it for misrepresentation uh, if they don't do this. So Microsoft, please be a bit more um, uh, accurate in your descriptions about what we're seeing. And I really do want to see an end to the whole in-game shtick because it's uh, it's it's not or great, an shall we yeah. say. Yeah. And the, yeah. freak, the the ray tracing shenanigans too with the oh yeah that's, stuff that like, bothers guys, me so much. Stop it! The games look good enough as is. You don't need to keep adding ray tracing features that aren't in the game like that. Yeah, <sighs> or just add them to the game. I mean, or just add them to the game. It's in the let, engine, let it, right? But just throw it in right, the game. Yeah. Put it experimental. Put it in there Who cares? For PC at least, right? In like, engine. Yes, <laughs> but um, to to get to the actual point, yes, if you've got a game running on PC, I think it's absolutely fine to show it running on PC, but. Yep, say yep. that it's running on PC. What's the problem? You know, <laughs> what's the problem? Um, okay, let's move on to the next question. It's Concrete Llama again. Hey! Uh, good, good, good question. Do you oh. think that releasing digitally uh, initially and then physically later is uh, the best route to go these days? Publishers reduce the risk of unsold stock. There's less waste and the physical version can actually contain the final patched and stable version of the game. A day one physical release is rarely worth it anyway these days, as most games either require multiple patches or in some cases the disc doesn't even contain the complete game or indeed anything at all in some, uh. <laughs> some scenarios. Um, John, you're obviously the go-to guy for this question. What do you reckon? Uh, I think there is a bit of a misconception here about patches and games in that I think because of high profile examples, there's become this like misconception that, oh yeah, every game just ships and you know, it's always broken on the disc and you need like a hundred patches to fix it. And there are actual places doing testing on this, like does it play among others and, and myself as well. I don't believe this is true. I actually think most games are quite good right off the disc these days. It really is just some high profi profile examples where those launch builds are not good. And I also say this as somebody that often plays console games before even the day one patch arrives, right? Like we're covering games. We get these games early. We're playing builds before the day one, and then we play it again when the day one hits. Uh, and by and large, I think most games are usually pretty darn fine right away. Right. The patches really address things like sometimes it adds like little extra features. Sometimes it fixes smaller bugs that aren't really game breaking or even that noticeable to most people. And then, of course, there's the multiplayer stuff where, yeah, you know, if, you, if you're a multiplayer game, who cares anyway? Like, there's no point to have a disc for like a multiplayer only game in the first place, I would say, outside of just getting sales. But like in terms of like owning it, no big deal. Uh but I will say, go, going on what he's saying, though, in the cases where you have a game that's pretty messed up, like a cyberpunk, uh, I, they wouldn't have done it there, obviously. But man, having like a later disc release is really nice. And I think specifically he's alluding to Alan Wake 2, which yeah. received a lot. Yes. Yeah. And that is an interesting one because... I think the game at launch was pretty good, but it's yeah. true that it launched with some issues, especially like I think the PS5 version had some some things that they needed to address, and they specifically mentioned that, right? Mm -hmm. performance, like there was some performance bugs, yeah. which they improved, um, but it still seemed pretty good. But I guess in this case, we will what we ended up getting here is like the the version that will ship on the disc includes the full game, uh, the latest patch and apparently the first DLC, as well as access to the second DLC when it hits. The caveat from what Remedy has written, though, employees from Remedy have written, is that that only applies to the PS5 version. Yeah. Uh, the Xbox version is not complete on the disc, and it does require downloads. And apparently just it just comes down to PS5 games ship on 100 gigabyte discs, Xbox use 50 gig discs, and rather than putting two discs in the box, uh, they're just like, well downloaded so i'm like why did you even release this then 
I am just flabbergasted but what you just said, Chad. I don't understand right? the purpose of this at all. What? Right? So one uh, version on, coming on the disc is just going to be an incomplete version, and that I don't get. Uh, that That's pretty frustrating, especially because, <sighs> you know, that's probably would have been the version I preferably might have gotten as to have a hard copy of it, but I'm just going to get it on PS5 instead. Yeah. Uh, and I know the X, the Xbox audience is largely not into discs, but if you're releasing it late like this in the special, this special way, like, I feel like they should just go the extra mile. The people that want to own Two the disc that yeah. have waited, they like, they want that. Like it's like they fully misunderstand what people, why people have asked for this. Right. Yeah. So yeah. I, I'm, I'm confused by that decision. Like, I'm happy at least one of the versions is okay, it sounds like, but it sucks that both disc versions aren't going to be but, complete. But what's with Microsoft not supporting larger disc sizes? They ne- So I think this was this was a holdover from the whole, uh, what did they call it, smart, smart uh, delivery, delivery. Mm-hmm. right? Where they needed to ship games that were compatible on both. And early on in the generation, this was actually a huge pet peeve of mine. For, for cross-platform games, the discs usually included just the Xbox One version. Yeah. If you wanted okay. to play Series X, you had to download it, uh, which was a shame. And eventually, though, once Xbox One went away, we, we did actually get proper you know Series X-only discs. But they never opened up game support, or they never allowed games to ship on 100 gigabyte discs. And I feel like this is only down to the fact that they needed to maintain compatibility with the VCR version of the Xbox One, the 2013 Xbox One, because that's the only one that can't read 100 gigabyte discs. The the Xbox One S and up can all read those discs. So it is still... The VCR is still a boat anchor holding us back. It's ridiculous. It's, it, it's just wow. yet another. Th- it's still, it's still hurting us from the grave. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I, I'm, I don't know what it, what the reasoning is why they've not allowed. Like maybe they just don't allow it. Maybe it doesn't work. It doesn't make sense to me. But like, allow it. I mean, I know physical media is not Microsoft's priority right now, obviously, but still. 100 gigabyte disk, guys. Come on. I don't really know what to say about this. This concept, I mean, referring to Alan Wake, they've basically turned the concept of a physical edition into a limited edition. A yeah. very, very limited edition. No, uh, not necessarily. There is a limited, limited edition, but there's also like a normal, like, uh, non special edition edition. So, where it's edition. just like the game, the game edition. Right. But it's still going to be produced in limited quantities compared Probably. to a full release, right? Yes, that's likely. So, you know, it's just sort of raising my hack, my hackles because it seems to be the further marginalization of physical media, uh, turning it into like an exclusive limited run, so to speak. Um, I don't think that's healthy for physical media just generally, but mm, I guess it's nope. better than nothing. Uh, mm-hmm. Which is, you know, like which, Mighty Number no. Nine, <laughs> which is like the alternative. Um, I think that's all we've got to say about that one. Let's move on. This one from Joe Tanko. Are you guys going to make another updated quote unquote PC gaming on a budget video? I built my last PC heavily influenced by that. I reckon the sunsetting of Windows 10 next year will cause some people to come out of the woodwork to look for that kind of content. Uh, yeah, I have been thinking about doing a, a, a budget PC build. And um, yeah, actually, here's the motherboard. It's right here in the background. I've had it for months. Owing to my schedule, I just haven't had the time to actually oh, uh, to actually build it, uh, the full thing. But yeah, this is basically got a very basic Intel board. I think I paid £70 for the Intel board. And uh, the processor is an i3 12100F. I paid £75 for that. Um, um, Corsair memory, I think it is um, yeah, there's 16 gigs here. I think that's all you really need. Yes. And yeah, I'm looking forward to building that. The question is which GPU we're going to use. And I'm kind of tempted by Arc because, you know, um, Intel can't give them away, but they do sell for extremely low prices to the point now where I saw the A770 16 gigs for like £230 last week. Oh my week, goodness. Wow. Which is, I reckon it could be a highly compelling all Intel budget build. 
as long as you're not really playing older games. But even there, apparently there's been um, significant revisions to the driver, which makes it quite interesting. So yeah, I'm, I'm quite interested in doing a video on that. And um, if you tap into the, the used, I'll tell you something else that I'm thinking about for uh, cheap PC builds. There's like a, a multitude of like lower end um, desktops that just end up on eBay and Facebook Marketplace. I reckon, you know, if you're realistically, you know, um, if you are completely budget orientated, um, an old quad core with eight threads would probably hold up pretty well with a modern CPU, something I'm looking forward to testing with the 12100F here. Because, I mean, it's, it's swiftly becoming apparent now that the, the console CPUs, although they're Zen 2 in nature, are more Zen 1 in performance terms. Um, so, yeah, I reckon you could probably get together a really cheap build uh, that, that could play modern games quite well, you know? Yeah. So, yeah, we're definitely going to do that. Uh, what do you think about this, Alex? I, I, I'm, I would just be curious about the final price of this because you said 70, 70. I don't think you said the RAM. Uh, it was the a 16 cost. gig one, I believe. Yeah, some 16 gig pit kit. But if it's DDR4, I assume, on that motherboard. Oh, yeah, yeah, this is DDR4. I mean, so it's going to be I3. cheap. It's going to yeah. be cheap. So, I mean, that's a really cheap build. And if you said you had like a 230, uh, you know, like the ARC A770 at 16 gigs for 230 pounds, like this is a surprisingly cheap machine. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I think the only thing about ARC, oh, I mean, I love the 16 gigs of VRAM, like you're just describing, though. Um, I would also, if there is a 3060, I would like to see that in it almost because just having tried out the 3060, I'm pretty impressed with it. All <laughs> things said and done. Uh, I, I kind of like the 3060 because um, you get DLSS in there too, which is more, you know, it's more commonly found in games than XCSS. I think uh, the 3060 yeah. slash 4060 thing is quite interesting because uh, I, I gave you both of them a couple of weeks ago. And uh, the 3060 isn't as powerful as a current generation console, but with DLSS, you can kind of make up the difference and then some. Um, and it's got the 12 gigs of memory, which is which is very, very useful, let's be honest. And then you've got the 4060, which is kind of getting there in terms of console performance. It's got frame generation. You know, it's got all of the latest ADA stuff, but the eight gigs of memory and the limited PCIe bus is... Uh, as we saw in your Hellblade video, proving right. problematic, right? Yes. Uh, that's one thing about these things. Like, I'm always a little bit worried about recommending something that for, if you're a casual user, that I just want to make your experience great without you having to fiddle as much. And that's why the 8 gigabyte thing always trips me up, where, like, I could maybe get you around that with settings, uh, or a really experienced user could get around that. But for, like, a casual user right now, 8 gigabytes is, like, it's a minefield about whether what type of performance you'll get because some ports are made great and some ports are made poorly. So mm. be prepared. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Any thoughts about budget PC gaming there, John? Uh, I only, mm, I only really think about budget PC gaming in relation to my son, <laughs> really, because uh, you know, he needs he has a pretty pretty dope PC, but it's there's still limitations on what's feasible. I mm -hmm. guess so. And it's more like he's not top of the line, but he also cares even at age 12, he cares a lot about frame rate. He yeah. is obsessed. He, he always leaves frame rate counters and stuff running. Like he installed like RTSS on his own computer. He just has that stuff running and all the time he's like monitoring Sick. what the numbers say. And he's like, Oh, you know? So like when he's playing certain games, you'll see him like lowering settings, just like, uh, get that frame rate out because he just likes it high which i thought was he even he's also the guy that like uh roblox has he plays a lot of roblox that has limitations on frame rate by default and he's like oh no i found a frame unlocker so i can run it at 165 <laughs> so it break it breaks some games but he always has this little unlocker thing running in the tray so he can like ramp it up to max <laughs> yo that's so. another interesting part so you just that's good i think um this this media this little budget build would have to be a sixty target really only machine for a lot of things as a result oh, of sure. like what just John's yeah, talking yeah. about it mm -hmm. especially CPU wise I think the GPU actually is very scalable the way you described yeah. it so 
Uh, but that would be the thing. It would be like a machine that targets 60. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's perfectly reasonable to sort of say, right, okay, this thing is going to do things that a console can do, but not necessarily produce the full turbo nutter experience that, you know, a higher end uh, hardware would do. The, the CPU side of things is quite interesting because it seems to be that um, older Lake 12th gen um, Intel, the lower end chips are getting really, really cheap. The 12400F that's been available for about £100, which, you know, it's going to be much better than the i3 for obvious reasons. But, you know, that's still like a really cheap um, entry level price point for a processor, I'd say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really interesting stuff. And I'm looking forward to, to, to actually doing this at some point, hopefully soon, um, because I honestly think people will be genuinely surprised by what you can do, but you do have to obviously set your expectation level there. Um, but yeah, looking forward to it. Let's move on to our final question. I Chew 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 Frames says, Ahoy Hoy founders, here is a DF General strategy Dude. question for you. Do you have any ambitions for growing your uh, audience base? What new types of viewers would you like to engage with? And through what types of content? Or are you quite satisfied with your current viewership and aim to maintain the status quo? Thanks, exc exclamation point. Um, I'm quite interested in your thoughts about this. Let's start with John. Man, two Simpsons references in one question. I love it. Right. <laughs> um, so my feeling is that obviously it's, it would be, I do want to grow the audience. I'd like to find more people, but I don't want to grow it by changing drastically what we do. I want to more like l figure out how to make what we do bigger, find more ways to do it more often and to do it better as opposed to just changing. Cause I feel like there's sometimes in, I've seen examples where a creator might try to chase like a broader crowd and they end up changing the way their content works. Uh, which ends up sort of not only does it isolate some of the original people that really enjoyed the content, but it also becomes something that you don't want to make. Uh, this is why, like in the case, uh, one of my friends posted a video once totally unrelated to his normal stuff. It was like an update on something else. And somehow that, that went viral and it got tons of views. So you get tons of subscribers coming in, but then like people were mad when the next videos weren't that. So he had to make another video basically like, look, this is what I'm doing here. Like if you came for this other type of content, that's not what this channel is. Right. And that is you know, as a business, you know, maybe that's not always the thing, but I feel like it's important to maintain what you're good at and what, what you like to do, but then find ways to grow that naturally in a way that hopefully finds more people, uh, and finding growing the audience doesn't have to be just changing what you do, right? Mm -hmm. It's, it's finding ways to get yourself out there to let so the, there will be people that would probably enjoy the content we make that just don't know about it yet. And hopefully we can find those people and bring them over. Mm -hmm. uh, that that right. would be the best thing I'd like to see. Well, Alex, I think it's no real secret that we want to do more with PC, which is right. basically fully in line with what John's saying there, which is to say that, you know, we want to do more of the stuff that we think is going to resonate with the audience and where we can be of service. And, um, you know, if you look at the sort of skew of content between the various pillars that Digital Foundry has, consoles is getting more attention than PC when, well, let's face facts, it's no real secret that um, the PC addressable audience on YouTube is much higher than it is for consoles. Just So it's just like a logical expansion at that point. Right. Uh, any, any thoughts? So, I, I, yeah, I've thought about this a lot. I think why, so like... The people who are really hardcore are into us from like the games perspective because we're covering games in a like a longer form fashion and talking about it. But that I don't think that necessarily resonates with every PC player out there. And I, I think that's fine because niche interests are part of life. But what I think does interest a lot of people is how a game runs on release and how can I get it to run better. And for us, I think just the getting that um like knowledge about our videos out on YouTube is actually a challenge via just using the service itself. Sometimes it feels a bit random algorithmically. Uh, it's sometimes a game, to, if you don't get it, the video out at launch, 
uh, that is another thing that will uh, make the video less successful and your audience doesn't grow as a result of that. Like usually if we get a video right out at launch, uh, it's almost guaranteed to do pretty darn well, actually, just because a lot of people are curious right at launch or even just shortly before launch. So for that, I really think to do that, uh, I've talked about this before, but we, I do need another person helping our hands like console side. We got John, Oliver, uh, and of course, Tom working those videos uh, generally really consistently. And so that's three people that you can split up a workload on of games. For a PC release, it is me. And then Rich can occasionally help me out. Uh, but Rich has a lot of other stuff to do. So I think we really need like another PC person just to yeah, make Muhammad sure we have resources. Well, does, um, uh, helps you out with settings. And yes, like, of course. Yeah, yeah. And stuff. yeah. Yeah, of course. Don't want to forget him. Because uh, he's helped the last two videos and then an avatar in last year he helped with too, which was really great. And I just need like more hands. But also another thing I think that would really help is that YouTube, like I said, is kind of limiting to just like algorithmically who can find us. And I always feel like we need better, like someone needs to know on some other channel, like YouTube, TikTok. YouTube shorts. I have no idea what it is, but there's, there's just gotta be some other way to get someone to say, Hey, wait, there's an entire video about this game that just came out and how it's going to run on my PC. I feel like we, we could reach an audience there by just advertising to them in some way. I don't know. I'm okay. talking about this in a more of like less of a, cause I think what we make is great. Uh, I think it's, I'm talking about like, how do we get that audience to us? And that's hard. That's harder. Yeah. Ultimately it's about content and, um, you know, basically building the audience in the same way that we did with consoles. And I honestly think that PC, the potential is for, for growth there is much higher without taking anything away from what we currently do. I mean, it's just a sound investment. And um, that goes for hardware, which I'm really passionate about, and the software side of things that you're really passionate about. And, um, you know, we've got some formative plans um, to, to do things. And now that... Um, read exhibitions is out of the picture and we're partnered with IGN you know we've got a more receptive partner to uh, uh, to make some of this stuff happen and we got to talk about retro you know there's yeah I mean that's that's really big to me I want to do it justice yeah because it's just it's the it's the passion content it's the stuff that I enjoy making the most but it also requires far and away the most amount of time to do right uh, the story isn't always obvious. It takes a long time to make those videos. And I just, I would really like to find ways to get more people to help me make this stuff happen because I can't do it by myself unless that was all I did. And even then it would still not be enough. It's just, it's hard to keep up with that kind of stuff. And I want to do it better and, and do it more often again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so the reason I put this question down on the docket is that essentially everything that we've just told you is exactly what we told IGN uh, when the acquisition happened. And, um, you know, it's, it's just, it was just great to have people that fully understood what we were saying and why it made sense. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, fingers crossed that we can actually get some of these plans rolling because uh, there's so much that we want to do. And, it, you know, obviously we would hope to see the audience base grow, but it is just about achieving the goals that we've set out uh, in terms of content as, a, you know, thinking about it more in terms of what we want to do as creators, as opposed to an end game of increasing the audience, which, you know, hopefully one would lead to the other. Right. Um, but yeah, you can just see that, you know, you just look at the video list on Digital Foundry, if we consider that there are three pillows, pillars, not pillows. pillows Maybe there's three, three pillows too. There could be three body pillows. pillows well. The rich body pillows. Rich, the rich body pillow. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's consoles, retro, and PC. And we've kind of tapped out on consoles. I'm not really sure there's much more we can do or should be doing there. And certainly not until, um, you know, new stuff arrives. But then there's retro and PC, which I think are massive growth areas for us, which we're all really excited about doing stuff for. And, you know, when we're going back to PC, if we are looking at a future where, well, you know, I think it's fairly self-evident that um, Microsoft at least will be sort of bringing PC and consoles closer together uh, than ever before, then absolutely we need to be there. Uh, any final thoughts on that beyond oh, what you just uh, said? I started 
well, it got sidetracked by other things, but I have started working on another retro video with another one directly to follow after that, which means hopefully the Sunsoft one will go public soon. That'd yes. be great. Uh, which that I, I, I want to hype that up again. Cause I feel like the Sunsoft video is one of my favorite videos I think I've ever made. Uh, just because we got access to things that normally you wouldn't get access to. Mm -hmm. And it allowed me to tell that whole story about like the entirety of Sunsoft Mm -hmm. Uh, all from the very beginning all the way up to the end and look at virtually every single game by and large yeah it was a it was a ton of work but i'm really happy with how it turned out and it's it's definitely one i'm extremely proud of Mm -hmm. so i hope people enjoy it when it does and the one you're working on sort of now is also looking quite exciting i mean i can just go ahead and say Shot, well, go, go ahead, say, why, not? why not because yeah. basically this was your idea it was like yep. what if we just apply like the digital foundry like hey multi-platform comparison idea to classic saturn and playstation stuff because i've often talked saturn and playstation i think is one of the most exciting eras for multi-platform because hardware was so fundamentally different that making games work across them both uh would often expose the strengths and weaknesses in a way that's that's super cool. Uh, and as a result, you have a wide range. There is no clear winner in the end. There are some games that are much better on Saturn, some that are much better on PlayStation, and then others that are good enough on both. Mm-hmm. And so I'm going to try this one first. We've picked a bunch of games for the initial the initial run, but this could be something I could revisit like as like a, a comparison series, you know, where it's like Saturn versus PlayStation, you know, the next chapter and then maybe do a different console versus a different one. And it's a, it's a slightly different, slightly different form of retro just in this, in the way that I plan to tell it. But, um, I, I'm really happy with what I've captured so far. And, uh, it's fun to see those things side by side and hopefully (laughs) it'll be enjoyable. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so yeah, look out for that because uh, I'm quite excited about it. Certainly, and then and the N64 stuff. after that too. Will, right. will happen. Will uh-huh. happen. It's in the works. But yeah, I was I was just uh, thinking back to uh, the Saturn versus PlayStation, and I was thinking about how great the lobotomy games were, and yeah. uh, I was thinking also back to an interview I did with Ezra Dreisbach, who was the um, uh, the tech genius, I guess you could call him, at Lobotomy yeah. Software. And uh, he actually did a version of Death Tank for the Sega Saturn. Interesting. Uh, no, for the um, for the Xbox 360. That's right, right, right. That's what it was. And we did, a, we did an interview in uh, 2009 with him. And uh, it was quite depressing, actually, because, you know, I was really interested in hearing his thoughts on the Saturn and how great it was and the results he got. And... Um, I'm just looking at the interview now and he's using language I don't think you'd even, even use in the, in the modern era. But <laughs> Oh, gosh. But he was so down on the Saturn. <laughs> but it's kind of miraculous that the game, uh, that the games they did were, were as good as they were. But, <laughs> yeah, I'm sure people will be uh, Googling uh, Death Tank Ezra drives back Eurogamer. And, uh, <laughs> you're, yeah, it's definitely we'll see some an interview. <laughs> Anyway, uh, that was the final question of this particular direct and therefore the end of the show. So please do like, subscribe, share if you enjoyed it. Ring bells for notifications or something. Uh, (laughs) Store.digitalfoundry.net. That's where you'll find our fantastic merchandising wares, including a variant of this lovely bespoke T-shirt and Mm -hmm. uh, a lot, lot more. Uh, That's all from us on this one. Thanks for watching and supporting Digital Foundry and we'll see you next week.